Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Bear with us. We're just about to share our screen. There it is. Perfect timing. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for uh, this session, Manage Your Classroom Remotely in Real Time. Uh, we have a lot of panelists, a lot of experts on the line to answer your questions and ensure that you have all the information you need to learn how to do just that. My name is Allie Heater. I am the Executive Briefing Center Manager here at Lenovo, and I am here just to walk you through the logistics of GoToWebinar. All of our attendees have been muted upon entry, so should you have any questions for our panelists today, please utilize the Questions tab, which is located on the GoToWebinar dashboard. You can ask those questions. If you have feedback, uh, even if you need our presenters to repeat something, you can do that at any time. There will be two polls that we'll have throughout the session as well, so we encourage you to please participate in those. And then at the end of all of this, uh, we will be doing a raffle, so hang tight to the end, please. And tomorrow, you all can expect an email, which is a thank you that will contain all of the links that we share today, as well as the recording from today's session. That is all I have from a logistics standpoint, so Rich, I will pass it over to you. Hey, thanks, Allie. Okay, hey everyone, this is Rich Henderson. I'm the Director of Global Education Solutions at Lenovo, and you are now part of our Lenovo Education Series on Six Smarter Strategies for Distance Learning. And we, we know this is such a challenging time, so I'm excited for this series where we're talking with experts both in the classroom, at the IT level, as well as product managers and leaders at Lenovo about how to address distance learning and the right strategies there. So we've had two sessions today. Uh, the first one that was on protecting students through content filtering uh, and student safeguarding, and then the last session on immersive learning. So if you're interested interested in those sessions, you can see we have the URLs available for you to watch those series. But today I'm super excited about something that I've been experiencing in my own home, which is how to keep students focused on a classroom session and how to manage your class remotely in real time. So let me just remind everyone that you are eligible for a, uh, a gift card today. So stay on the line. We'll, we'll make a drawing towards the end. And then if you attend three of our sessions, then you're eligible for a $100 uh, Amazon gift card. So we're super excited to have you. Thanks for being here. And I'll turn the time over to Delia to introduce our guests. Thanks, Rich. So I am uh, Delia DeCourcy. I am on Rich's team, global education uh, team, and I'm a solutions manager at Lenovo. And I'm really excited to be talking about this topic as well, uh, managing your class remotely, especially because as a classroom teacher, I taught middle school for many years, and I was in a one-to-one -one environment, and students were really fast. It was like they had a trigger figure, finger. When I was walking around the classroom, if they were looking at a website that they were not supposed to be looking at, they could switch so quickly and I couldn't even see it. Now this was this was pretty long ago. This was like early 2000s. So we didn't have we didn't have a solution in my school to deal with that. But thank goodness we do have that now. Um, so we're going to be talking about that today, especially when it comes to remote learning. You know, just last week I was over at my brother's house and my nephew, who was a 10th grader, and I, I hate to to call him out here, but he was supposed to be in a synchronous remote class session and instead he was playing minecraft i mean the session was playing in the background but he was playing minecraft so rich probably has some some similar stories from his household he has several remote learners uh rich yeah. you care to share one yeah it's pretty bad over here if i'm honest with you i my uh, i have four kids so one's in college and she's on her own but i have a 11th grader i have a sixth grader uh no a seventh grader and then a fifth grader so the good thing is that the 11th grader and the seventh grader, uh, the, the normal parenting strategies have been working fairly well in terms of you know, how, giving them independence, checking in on them and all that stuff. But for my fifth grader, um, he is pretty sneaky. He, he will uh, you know, have his headphones on, we're all doing uh, virtual learning. He'll have his headphones on, but yeah, I'll walk into the room and he's switching. He, he, I can see his finger, he's got a touch screen. He, he jumps his <laughs> finger up there to close yeah. the, the YouTube tab that he mm -hmm. had open where he was watching some, some Roblox like video about how to like gain enough Robux doing like these weird strategies. And I'm like, hey, how's class going there, buddy? Oh, good, good, good. Oh yeah, okay, why is your video off? Oh, my video's off, oh gosh. You know, it's like, okay. So 
I, I'm, you know, active during the day checking in on my student, but but honestly, we've got to find uh, better solutions for this, uh, not just for the parents, but for the teachers out there who are trying to, they're hardest to like teach a session and they think their students are engaged, but they're not. Um, they're just staring at the screen and doing something else. Well, fortunately, we have guests today who, who have been using that solution um, and experts who have created that solution for us. So I am excited uh, to have them introduce themselves. So um, Kobe, you want to start us out and just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go around the, the virtual room. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Kobe Gurr. I'm the general manager of a group called Lenovo Software. And we are primarily building a, a software for education for over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, I've been part of this team for over a decade, and I just love the passion that we get when we get to build amazing software for teachers. And uh, to see it, you know, really affect the lives of students, it, I, nothing better in my life than when I can watch it uh, go be used by these schools. And, you know, we, we saw this uh, evolution with the pandemic hit, and uh, wow, what a change in education. And, and I'm just so grateful that we're able to uh, be here and share the experience with others so that we can all learn together on how to make this effective, uh, you know, going forward. So thank you for letting me join you. Great to have you here, Kobe, thanks. And Emily, how about you? Let's hear, let's hear from you. Sure, so I'm a land school account executive and I'm also a former teacher. So I taught fourth and fifth grade. So very much understand the switching of tabs and having the screen that should be open and then seeing YouTube on the side. Um, I was also a literacy coach. So very familiar with being in the classroom and supporting classrooms. Thanks, Emily. Excited to have you here and to, to talk to you some more and, and see a demo later. And then one of our guest guest stars, guest speakers today, Chris Parker. Chris, tell us about yourself. Yeah, my name is Chris Parker. I'm the technology coordinator at Gateway Regional in Massachusetts. Uh, I've been a land school user for about five, five and a half years now. And you're telling funny stories about remote learning. Well, I'm at home and the teacher, Rachel, who's supposed to be on, I'm trying to get her on right now. So this is this is our lifestyle right now is, you know, how can we support teachers and students remotely? So hopefully Rachel will be joining us in, in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, we know she is incredibly busy. So we'll be psyched when she jumps on um, and to hear from her. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Rich, and uh, we can continue our conversation. So so what I've seen or what the industry is, is showing us is that um, one of the most challenging things about remote learning is the student engagement. You're seeing this animation pop up. But it's not just about um, the pure engagement score, it's it's the digital divide. So, you know, students who, and this is, this is kind of proving out, uh, if you're not familiar with the term digital divide, think about the homework gap, other, other areas where students who, who come from different backgrounds have different abilities to succeed. And unfortunately, the results are showing that students that come from poorer backgrounds are becoming less and less engaged. Um, and the ability for school leaders to, to really help those students perform is, has been decreased uh, with, with going to remote learning, where students who are in more uh, affluent or back, uh, kind of more stable backgrounds are more engaged, actually. They're able, these tools and just normal kind of web meetings and, and these types of things are working uh, because of the support that they have and the technology infrastructure that they have. So, so teachers are, are feeling this burden where, you know, they're the ones who are the frontline workers dealing with students um, and trying to balance that fulcrum between classroom management and remote learning. How do you um, kind of continue to make in, engaging instruction, effective communication, while then kind of getting your learning um, uh, objectives across and that there's technology obstacles as Chris was describing um, so you know I, I know we've had people here that have been in the classroom um, I guess Kobe from your perspective um, what what have you seen um, as challenges doing this prior to COVID and now in a in kind of a current and post-COVID world yeah thanks Rich so it, when I look at technology as it started to come more and more into the classroom you know, I, I would always get a smile on my face as I would see more and more adoption of technology. But if, if you take it at the most simplest form, imagine handing Chromebooks or Windows devices out to all the students in the classroom, and everybody is so excited to use it, right? They all wanna power it up. They wanna to go to their website. They wanna do their thing. 
And, and even at such a young age, this can become a real challenge for teachers. How do they get everybody into one cohesive general direction, right? How do I get them to use this for what we need to be focused on? I mean, there's such excitement about using the technology that we would just find, you know, a bit of the distraction almost. And teachers find themselves basically trying to teach a lesson plan, but unless they can guide that effectively or, or help put some, um, you know, I think about the bowling alley where you can put the bumper bars up, you know, put those bumper bars up where they can guide them down this path to generally get to where they want to go. That's been one of the biggest things that I saw, you know, pre-COVID where it was just, I want to be able to help the students. I want to be able to guide them along the path. I mean, imagine, imagine even just a website, everybody, we are going to go uh, to, uh, you know, uh, nasa.org. That's what we're going to go to. You're going to have spelling errors. You're going to, how do we get everybody there quickly, easily? It becomes a, a spelling nightmare. It becomes a time-wasting nightmare. So you've got to have a way to do all of that. And then in addition to that, Rich, right, the thing that, you know, now I've handed out 30 devices, if, if that's how many students I've got, how can I as an instructor or a teacher know how they're progressing, right? Are they, is somebody falling behind? Can I help that group out? How, how do I do all of that all at the same time? So those are the challenges that we saw, you know, with, uh, you know, just using this amazing technology, you know, th that, that's what I hear more and more often from, from teachers that I speak with when I visit their classrooms. Yeah, I, I couldn't help but think, Kobe, when you're talking about nasa.com, I was like, okay, nasa.com is pretty easy. But what if I was trying to send students to like onomatopoeia.com or archaeopteryx.com? Oh, wow. It's like yeah. we have spelling errors for days. It never gets there. Um, but but Chris, let me ask you. So, you know, from a content perspective, are you seeing like now that you're having to go digital, all of this content is digital, all of these kind of web-based resources. Can you talk about some of what some of the challenges you've seen there? Um, it was it was really a struggle at first for us because as everybody remembers, you know, on that fateful Friday the 13th, we literally in the morning had a meeting and sent devices home that afternoon without thinking, how are we going to do this? So it, it became a struggle to make sure that everybody stayed on task and had the appropriate resources, number one. And number two was, as you spoke to the engagement part of it. And it, it was very hard to describe what optimal engagement is or how are we going to judge that so the ability to be able to kind of tune into those kids and and individually assess each one of them um, as as best as we could reach out to them let them know we're here you know i, I look at the difference between pre-covid and and after covid is now pre-covid the teacher would be over your shoulder looking at your chromebook now we're hundreds of miles or not hundreds, but miles away from that student, but we can still look over their shoulder and see their Chromebook. So from a content management standpoint, that that was really a big hurdle for us to get over. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So so what I've seen is that, you know, some of these challenges around um, we kind of a post COVID thing are, are not just on the teaching side, but also the additional challenges on the home front. Like, you know, this this is not, you know, 30 kids in a classroom setting. They're they're at home. I've got pets all around me. We've got distractions. You've got computers. You've, you, you've got your mobile phone. You've got Xboxes. Like, you know, there's so many more distractions. Um, so maybe, Kobe, any, any additional thoughts on kind of how COVID has compounded some of these issues around classroom management? I mean, it's not just about sending your student to school anymore, right? They have to figure out, do these homes, do these, do these locations have connectivity? Do they have a device? Um, once they're on the network or in the network in the classroom, how do they join the Teams call or the Google Meet, right? So there's all of this that goes into, uh, into making that happen. And on top of that, as, as Chris just alluded to, how can they look over the shoulder? Right. Um, it's 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 you know, you were describing your son uh, being uh, watching the YouTube and the second tab there on the Chromebook. Right. How can the teacher uh, see that and help realize, OK, I need to engage, uh, you know, Rich's son a little bit more or I need to, you know, hand a little homework or, you know, I, I think about, you know, even worse than that, the, the student that's fallen behind. Right. How can that student ask a question, raise a chat? Right. Those kinds of things. And um, you know, my son, who's who's uh, 
I guess he's in sixth grade. He he did. He does fall behind, and uh, you know they'll get the COVID quarantine, and he made it back in school for about two weeks, and then it was quarantined again. And I'm like, wow, you know this is just from going in school to back at home, and how do I keep him focused? Um, you know, because I've got a day job too. How do I how do I provide that support? Make sure he's going to school, um, and that when he is in school that the teachers have a platform where they can help guide them down that path. I can't imagine uh, just, just sending out, you know, uh, let's talk about the way before, right? I just stick out an email, send an email out to all 30 students and, and hope that they all, you know, join. Right. And, and I get, you know, 50%, you know, then, then I've got 50% that didn't make it and they're falling behind. And unfortunately my, my student was one of those that fell behind and, you know, it was a, it was a bit of a nightmare trying to catch him up. So, Having a platform today that lets that happen is just huge. Thanks, Kobe. So, okay, um, so you should be seeing a poll that has popped up. Uh, if you'll just weigh in and let us know, how, how are you teaching today? Is it remote synchronous instruction where everyone is on class at the same time? Is it remote asynchronous uh, where, you know, everyone is doing assignments at their own pace? Is it a hybrid or is it face-to-face? -face? Let us know uh, which one and we'll read out the poll results in a few minutes. Um, I, I do want to introduce Rachel. She's been able to join the call. And Rachel, thanks so much for joining, I'm sure, after what was a hectic school day for you. Um, can you hear me, Rachel? Yes, I can hear you. Hey, great. Good to have you. So, you. so we've been talking about some of the challenges um, that are in the classroom today and how this has been compounded by COVID. I mean, from a teacher's perspective, what types of tools do you think you need to help overcome these problems? Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff that you guys have said so far is definitely kind of, you know, is, is on point. Um, the communication is a big deal. Like the kids need to feel that they're connected to you. And when you're not in the classroom, you're missing that connection. And they need to know that you're watching. You know, like if you're in a classroom and you sit at your desk and you don't pay attention to what the students are doing, they're just going to do whatever it is they're going to do. So they need to know that, that that presence is there. So that being able to monitor, that being able to communicate, that ability to answer questions, like all of those things are things that, you know, we need to make sure that we can still do, um, even if they're not in the classroom in front of us. And I think I just lost track of where I was going with that. So hey, I apologize. Well, that's, actually, that's kind of cool, actually. I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about like a classroom setting because, you know, it's one thing to be walking around the classroom and looking you know over students shoulders or what they're looking at but there are times that you want students to be doing independent work the thing that i've seen that's really cool about land school that i know emily will show us in a little bit is you could you could do that you could sit back at your desk and be working on kind of the next section of the lesson that you're about to deliver while the students are doing independent work you can monitor still what they're working on you can see the thumbnails of all the pieces um, where where each student is looking, what they're on, you can see the pacing, kind of if everyone's on the same page, and and so I think from that standpoint, it does allow both synchronous class sessions, but you could have an asynchronous um, session that's running and still kind of see where students are, uh, kind of in that in that process. So so I love that. Um, what about um, communication? You know, how how are you getting feedback, Rachel, from from your students in a remote environment <laughs> so um there's you know there's a couple ways that we do most what i do mostly is kind of like asynchronous stuff so that idea that i have my one computer and i have my other computer and i have my land school open over here and i'm monitoring what they're doing and i'm watching but i'm in the meet over here so if they need to meet with me personally they can do that and so they can come to the meet and they can communicate but also they really do like communicating individually like if I send them a message on the land school, it says, hey, you know, I noticed you're not on the right thing or they, they raise their hand. I'm having trouble with this and I can kind of talk to them there individually. And they really like to do that. And then sometimes that complicates things for me because I got two things going on at the same time that I'm trying to monitor. But I get the little ding, -ding notice and I know to go check and I can. And, and I think for them, it really helps for them to know that you're still there and you can see what they're doing. And like, if they're on the wrong video, I can say, hey, that's not the right one. You're supposed to do this one first. And I can kind of call them back that way. And, you know, and they're like, oh, I, I don't see the name of it or whatever. And I can bring them back to the meet if I need to without interrupting what everybody else is doing. So yeah. um, that, that ability for them to be able to tell me what they need 
and me to be able to say, yes, I can see you. Yes, you can you can come back and you can tell me and I can help you figure out how to get there. Okay, that's really important. So, so I, I think that messaging piece is really interesting. Like how how do you do how do you have checkpoints and and kind of mini exit tickets and you know raise your hands formative checks kind of throughout that lesson um, series. How do you, what is your kind of messaging? Are you using Land School to send the messages to students, or are you using something that's built into Meet or Teams? Uh, and a little bit of both. So you know I have the Meets in the Google Classroom that I'm running, and then I have the Land School. So okay. kind of the check-in stuff and will happen maybe in the meet, but the watching what they're doing, making sure they're on the right page, making sure they know what they need to do, that they're not lost. If they need to let me know if they need help, and then I can go meet with them individually and take care of that kind of happens in the land school portion of it. Yeah. Hey, Emily, real quick on, on you, just because I, I think people might be interested in this kind of messaging piece. How does that look on the student side when when the student gets a message from the teacher in land school, how does that show up on the screen and how do they respond to that? Yeah, so I'll show this when I do the demo in just a bit, but they will just see a little tab that shows up on their um, on their screen. And so if they wanted to initiate a chat with the teacher, they would just click on this little land school air icon in their tray. So the it's really distraction free for the student, but if they do receive a message from the teacher, or if they wanna message the teacher themselves, really easy, comes right up in a little chat box. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times one of my kids has come to me with a question and I'm like, hey, that is a really good question. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing the parent thing where I'm like, you know, <laughs> you know, Graham, if you have this question, chance is that, you know, everyone else in your class probably has the same question. They just aren't brave enough to ask it. He's like, well, I don't want to ask it either. And and I'm like, OK, well, you need to just like private message your teacher. So I love that that's built into land school that you could just private message your teacher and not be embarrassed, your teacher could see your screen that you're working on and really give you quick feedback on what you're doing right or wrong. Which is great too in kind of to change from maybe a Microsoft Teams or a Google Meet where everyone is seeing those questions and then the questions just kind of go a little too long. So it's nice that it's just from the student to the teacher and it's in a private setting. Yeah, that, that's great. That, that embarrassed student, as you said, Rich, right, that person can now raise that hand and not feel like well, I'm just going to sit here and, and and fall behind. You know, they can raise that hand. That teacher can reach out and and make a difference. So that's exactly right. Yeah, I think 11 year old me would have been the kid like not maybe not to ask questions, but you know, 46 year old me, I'm like, question. I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so I, I have a, well, I have a question just to clarify. Yeah. So are students able to message each other? Because that would have been the 11 year old me if I had that opportunity. So I actually was on a phone call with a customer this morning who is super interested in land school. They're, um, they've used it in the past and their only concern was we don't want uh, students messaging each other. And so that's definitely designed purposely that um, a teacher can initiate a chat with a student or multiple students, but a student cannot chat with another student. And teachers are very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really good design. Um, there is one more thing, I'm sorry, that, that yeah, kind of came to mind talking about that communication. What, I don't know how many times I've been saved by somebody messaging me and saying, hey, this link isn't working, or hey, you forgot to assign a form to everybody in Google Classroom, and then I'm able to go in quick, and then on land school, even if they're not in the meet with me, I can type in a message to everyone, blast it out and say, hey, I fixed that link, it's ready, go back to it, you need to refresh it, it's good to go. So I mean, in that aspect, it saved me a ton as well. Huge, huge time saver, exactly, that's, our, that's great, Rachel. Cool. Okay, so um, results of the poll, just so everyone's aware, so 43% of the audience said they're doing hybrid learning, 29% are remote synchronous, 14% uh, remote asynchronous, and 14% face-to-face. So we got a really broad uh, mix of audience. So Delia, um, maybe let's go into kind of this next segment on um, with this remote and hybrid learning setups. Yeah, yeah, so great, great segue. Thanks, Rich. So I, I'm actually really curious to hear from Rachel. Rachel, I know you're teaching fifth grade, but can you talk to us a little bit about what does your class look like these days? What model is the district using right now? What's a typical day in your life look like? <laughs> we just started hybrid. So a typical day in my life has gotten a lot more complicated. Um, when they were all remote, okay, I, I wrapped my head around that, I got that, right? So now I have kids that are here four days a week, two groups of kids that are here two days a week, and then a group of kids who are all at home. So I basically have four different groups running at the same time. 
Wow. So yeah, it, that's, right. That's a lot. To, that's a lot of class to manage. <laughs> yeah, so, it is, it's a ton of class to manage, and so really having the land school up and running and having you know the extra computer and having the kids up on the screen and being able to make sure the kids at home are doing what I'm doing while I can walk around the room and watch what the kids in front of me are doing and it's crazy so it does help definitely give me a way to kind of organize all that which is really important yeah so I want to dig into that a little bit more deeply but before we go there I let's have everybody in the audience um, Answer the poll. So what are your top two synchronous remote learning challenges this fall? Rachel just listed numerous um, that she's having in a hybrid environment. Um, so is it distraction in your students' remote environment, lack of visibility to what students are doing online, tech tools aren't capable of keeping class focused, um, and, or limited communication functionality? And I think you can select all that apply there. So we will share results um, shortly. So, so Rachel, talk to me a little bit about, um, my understanding is you used Land School prior to the pandemic, is that right? Yes. Okay, yes. so talk to us about what features you used primarily then or how you use them versus what you're using now. I mean, how has Land School functioned similarly and differently in these different um, situations for you? Yeah, and I think even when I first started using it, it wasn't Land School Air, it was just like regular land school on the computer um, and they were a little younger so it was a little bit different back then it was more of a monitoring tool tool I needed their attention I could blank their screens they weren't mm -hmm. allowed to keep clicking and doing whatever they were doing I could kind of get their attention wear it away bring them back I could kind of check it and watch out for like you said earlier that extra tab that's open that's really a video game I could mm -hmm. watch out for that um, so it was more kind of just like a, a classroom management sort of thing which, it, I mean, it still is, but now it's more being monitoring what they're doing, guiding them, making sure they're on the right page, communicating with them. Uh, I can't walk over to the desk and see what they're doing if they're not in the building. So there's definitely a limiting web, turning off screen, like all sorts of things that are much, that are happening much more than would be if they were just in the classroom with me. Hey, uh, hey can I jump in here, Delia, just so if that yeah, quick please. question. Hey, yeah. so um, Rachel, I was just trying to, make sure everyone understood this. So you mentioned Land School uh, and then Land School Air. So uh, Land School Original, which we, we kind of call classic, maybe Kobe, you, could you talk about kind of real quickly, what, what is yeah. Land School that was on installed on a device versus Land School Air? How are they different, et cetera? Absolutely, thanks Rich. So the original product that, that was created, you know, 30 years in the business now, uh, we, we now call it Land School Classic. And, what that was meant to do was really when networks and, and, and keeping the devices, so you would think of your lab or maybe your library, um, you would just manage devices within the brick and mortar of the school, right? There was no web service involved. It was just all within the boundaries of the school right there on Chris Parker's network at Gateway Regional. So they would stay inside there. When uh, we introduced about two years ago, we created a cloud version of, of that product called Land School Air. And uh, the beauty of that product and, and the timeliness of that product couldn't be better, but this one allows you to uh, be anywhere, right? So students can be at home, uh, teachers can be remote, you know, I can be remote, everyone can be remote, and yet I'm still able to join class, attend, and, and have a lot of the same capabilities as, as the classic product. So, and it was purpose built for simplicity, um, you know, keeping all of those those time saving capabilities in mind. But yeah, that's the biggest difference, Rich. Is uh, you know okay. we still support Chromebooks, Windows, Macs, all of that good stuff, both platforms. Okay, so iOS, Windows, Chrome, basically anything that would be in a school environment. Awesome. Thanks, Delia. Yeah, thanks for interjecting that because that is one of the questions I get most often about Land School versus Land School Air. Um, so I, let's look at the results of the poll. This is a good time to do that. Um, so 53% of the audience said distraction in the student's remote learning environment was a big issue. 60% said a lack of visibility to what students are doing online. 13% said tech tools aren't capable of um, doing what students need. And then 27% said limited communication functionality. So let's focus on this lack of visibility because I actually, this is one of my favorite features of Land School and Land School Air. That's that thumbnail monitoring. Is that something, Rachel, that you tend to use um, with great frequency? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're always up on thumbnails and I'm always 
scrolling up and down, checking, clicking, you know, clicking on the person, messaging, and kind of looking at them that way. And the nice thing is if I know what they're supposed to be on, I can look really quick and see if somebody's not on it. So I spend a lot of time looking at whole groups and kind of, you know, monitoring back and forth that way. Yeah. Awesome. So, so this might be a good opportunity to, to have Emily show us what all of this looks like on screen. You mind sharing your screen, Emily, and, and giving us a quick demo? Looks like you're still muted, Emily. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. Emily. Okay. Hey, there while you're pulling that up, um, while you're pulling that up, let me ask a, a quick question. This this may be a hard one, actually. I was going to save this one to the end, but it just I think the timing is good. Um, one of the large districts that that I've worked with in the United States uh, actually didn't want to use Land School Air or Land School in general because actually they were worried that teachers were less engaged with their students. That made them feel feel like teachers were just going to sit behind the desk and and look at their thumbnails and not engage with the students chris and, and rachel have you guys seen that to be the case have you had fear about that happening in your district when uh when we first put chromebooks in teachers are actually begging us for a way to monitor the kids um <clears throat> we uh we started off with you know take this and we had kids laying in the hallways and whatnot and it, it was always that one or two kids that went to sit in the corner with their you know, back to the corner. So teachers wanted to be able to see uh, with with good regularity what the students were doing. So there was never any real fear of that. I will say that once COVID hit, we actually um, had a discussion about what is appropriate times for land school to be operational. Um, whereas during a school day, we would probably only keep it open until three or three thirty. Now our school day had extended, so. We had to kind of sit and think about that, and we decided that the benefits definitely outweighed, you know, the the bad side of it. That the ability to reach out if we needed to reach out was something that we wanted. That's great. I think I think uh, if it's okay, Dealey, can we dig into that a little bit more? I want to after after the demo, let's do let's look at the demo, and then maybe we yeah. dig into that a little bit more, Chris, because I want to understand maybe some of those concerns and and how you could manage this. Um, you know, outside of school hours. Sounds like a good plan. Take take it away, Emily. Awesome. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. It looks like you moved the demo to the other screen there, Emily. We're looking at the Windows desktop. Oh, it was on there. Sorry. Yeah, there okay, we go. There you You're go. Good. Okay, awesome. So one thing I want to mention before I get started is that when I was a fourth and fifth grade teacher, I had or allowed for flexible seating. So I allowed for my students to sit wherever they wanted within the classroom, except for when they were using a device. So when they were using a device, I wanted them all to be facing the same way so I could see exactly what they were doing on their device because as Rich and Rachel have mentioned, um, fourth and fifth graders are savvy and they can quickly go between tabs. So what's fabulous about Land School Air is it allows teachers to have that same visibility while students are working remotely. Um, so with that, I'll get started. Land School can absolutely be utilized in a brick and mortar setting. Um, some of the features that I'll highlight today are just especially applicable for a remote environment. So when a teacher logs into his or her Land School Air account, they'll see this screen. So they'll see their classes here. Um, if the teacher needed to create a class manually, so for example, let's say you've got a literacy coach or a math resource teacher who sees small groups throughout the day, it's real simple to create a class. So I'll just kind of show that process right now. So you just click on the plus sign, you would name the class. So let's say I'm a reading resource teacher and I have like a reading comprehension group that I see every morning. I can choose a banner. And then I would select the students that are in this group. So you can also search for students specifically. And then one of the features that was mentioned is that you can do web limiting. So during a class session, you can decide if you want to block all websites, just block specific websites, or just allow specific websites. And this can be turned, in, turned on and off by the teacher during a class. And then lastly, I think Rachel mentioned this as well, the blank screen. So this basically kind of gives the student pretty much zero control over the device. So you can create a customized message here, choose a color, and then your class is created. So really easy to create classes if you need them on the fly or um, if you're having an after school group, et cetera. 
So let's say I am ready to start class. I have English language arts. As soon as I press start class, I will get to see my students. And again, a huge portion of land school air is being able to see what your students are doing while they're far away and learning from the glory of their own home. So these are the student thumbnails. I can change the size of this. So right now this is extra large. If I've got lots of students in my class, I can make this medium or as small as extra small. I'll stick with this as extra large. One nice hey, thing Emily, what about people who have like need glasses like me and they need like extra, extra, extra large? <laughs> so this is the largest we've got. Um, Rich, maybe you want to have like a really big monitor so <laughs> your, your device is a little bigger. But one okay. great thing is yeah. I can do this and I can see the tab nice and large. So that, that might help you, Rich. And then That's perfect. <laughs> you can also do a list view. And we've talked about this a bunch with the multiple tabs. So this is great because you will see all of the tabs that student has open. And the teacher actually has the ability to close a tab or add it to an allowed or blocked website. So again, you get the full visibility of, yes, the student might be on the screen for a little bit, but you can see every tab that they have open. And oh, wait, then, can you, can you show that one more time? So how do you see multiple tabs that a student has open? Sure, so I'll go to Julie Johnson, the computer sitting in front of me. So she's got this Penn State tab, but then she's also got this NHL tab as well. So I can close that tab and it is now off of her computer. If it's not the first tab that she has up, can a teacher also view that tab? Let's say um, that it's a tab, but it's not the one that's primary in focus. Will they be able to see like what's on that other tab or does it need to be the one that's in focus? So you see, the one. yeah, you see the one in focus, but you can see like, you know, obviously the URL here as far as which one is um, also up. Okay, awesome, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And then here too, I mean, just for quick visibility, the teacher can see Curtis has three tabs open, Julie Johnson just has one, and Diego has two. So again, a teacher who's like Rachel having four different classes to have to monitor, it can be a quick glance as far as what students are doing. Hey, Rachel, have, when, you've, when you've seen this before, have you ever used that feature? Have you closed tabs from students? And are they like, um, did they ever give you... Are they ever rebellious about it? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't know how rebellious you're going to be from your house, but, you know, I'm sure that there might be some words being exchanged that I don't ever hear. Um, but, I mean, you know, I've shut stuff off on people. I've blank screen. You know, they're, probably, I've, they're probably just like, oh, shucks, spoiled again. Yeah, you know, like I caught them watching videos instead of attending class and shut off their screen and sent them a message and said, you need to come back here. Nice. So, I like it. Yeah. That's awesome. I think it makes a teacher feel real powerful too. Like, what? How did they do that? So for those younger kids, it's kind of fun. Um, another feature that definitely can be used in the brick and mortar setting to, you know, help um, save time, but for sure in a remote environment is this push website. So I can push a website to all students or to one student or a group of students. But what's great about this too is let's say your students are working some, on something and then you wanna bring them back to a Google Meet environment and have like a reflection off the lesson, then you can actually send that Google Meet or Microsoft Teams link and those students will be directed to that video conferencing. So it's a great way again to get all students on the same page quickly um, and get them all in the same place. And the student doesn't need to click anything on their device. It just um, puts that new tab open right away. That is really cool. Hey, um, Rachel, how, how easy was it to learn how to do these types of things in land school? Um, I mean, it, I just kind of clicked around and figured it out. You know, it was- Oh, you know, oh so you're, you're, one, of those, you're one, one of those click around, figure it out types. Okay. Well, Chris might tell us uh, how well this has done rolling out to the rest of the district, Chris. Uh, what kind of uh, professional development type of, of resources have you guys had to put in place to help train teachers on how to use this? Honestly, land school has been, of all the things I've rolled out the easiest um, to roll out to, to teachers and staff. Um, we did about, uh, I don't know, about a half hour, 40 minute training session at the beginning of the year. Um, I expected, you know, 90% of the teachers would forget by the next day because we pushed out so much data. So when they sent the request in to be added as a teacher, I, I literally sent them the email from Land School Air saying, here you go. 
as well as the teacher guide, which is three or four pages. And I think I've had one question back from a teacher. It's just that simple for them to grasp and figure out. Some of the more advanced things um, like closing tabs, things like that, we may you know, have to work with them a little bit, but the basics of loading it, getting it to sync with Google, um, being able to be visible to the students and how to chat, they pick that stuff up really quickly. Now, would you say you just have a group of really, really tech savvy teachers? I would say we're like any school district and there's a good mix. How's that? Great. <laughs> um, and yeah, really cool. I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, Emily, I'm interrupting your excellent demo, but I'm, no, envisioning, I'm envisioning this teacher training. But uh, I just have this, have this vision of having like the new student devices out and you, you bring the teachers in, let's say we're all in school and they're all sitting down and you're like, hey, we just want you to evaluate all the new student devices, you know, just open them up and, and use them, whatever. You know, five minutes later, the teachers are on all kinds of different websites and then you could just hit a button and move them all to the site that you want them on. <laughs> right then, like every single teacher in that school is going to be hooked and like, okay, I want to start using this today. So I think it's such a powerful tool. Um, I'm excited. Well, it's funny that you say that, Rich, because I think back to, I used to give professional development as a literacy coach, but as a teacher, I also sat in on a lot of professional development. And us teachers sometimes say that we're the worst students because you put a device in front of us, we're supposed to listen to the presenter and we get distracted. And so, I mean, this could be used even for facilitators who are giving PD to teachers in addition to students, because anyone who has a device in front of them, it's really easy to get distracted. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's funny because I did a PD today and I, uh, they were supposed to watch the video and come back and I really wanted, I was like, oh, it doesn't work on them. I really wanted to send a message that, okay, time's up and come back. And I'm like, oh, let's do it. Right, exactly. I think there might be a mutiny if you put land school on teacher devices. <laughs> Very much so. Right. Um, so then as have been mentioned as well, um, teachers have the ability to chat with the students and then the students have the ability to initiate a chat with the teacher. So I've got Julie Johnson in front of me as a student device and she messaged the teacher. So she sees this little icon here that's pink. She clicks over here. And I can see that chat with Julie. And what's nice is again, the teacher can chat with the whole class and say, hey, we've got 10 minutes left and then we're gonna regroup or they can chat with just an individual student. And one thing that's nice too, and I don't know, Rachel, if you've used this as well, but you can download the conversation log. So if anything is said that you want for your own personal records or you wanna show a principal or a parent, you can do that. And you can also mute the conversation. So if you've got a Rich Henderson who's asking tons and tons of questions and you just want to say, hey, try it out on your own, or um, if they're taking something, an assessment that they really shouldn't have any assistance on, you can mute that conversation and then that's deactivated for the student. I like how you called me out there, Emily. That was, you're supposed <laughs> to use, use power like, with caution, <laughs> right? I mean. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I think those are really the big main features as far as in a remote environment. Of course, you're able to um, limit the web browsing. So if you want everyone to research NASA, for example, you could just allow students to go on that site and you would just turn on your limit websites for all and they would only be able to go to whatever websites you allowed or not go to whichever websites were blocked. If the student did go to a website that they shouldn't go on, it's kind of nice, they get this screen and it also shows them the only website or the website that they are permitted to go to. Boiled so, again. Yeah, really easy to use um, as, yeah. That's awesome. Hey, Emily, um, are there any other parts that you think um, the audience should see before we move on? Actually, yeah, I don't think this was mentioned yet, but we've got, we've had a lot of conversations with districts around privacy and some districts are actually using personal devices during this time. And so we always let um, districts know that you can set active hours. And so this would be at the account level. And basically this allows teachers to only monitor the students and create a class, or I'm sorry, start a class during these active hours. So for example, if school runs from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., you can set active hours and a teacher's ability to start a class is deactivated if they were to try outside of those hours. So this isn't for teachers to see what students are doing at 9 p.m., it's just so they can really monitor and engage with students during the school day. That's hey, great. So, 
you're, you were actually mentioning that Chris, Chris and his district, they chose to, I guess, back that off of what the normal school hours were just so they could help later on in the day. But the greatness there is you've got the flexibility to decide uh, if, if you want that capability or not. We, we've thought that through. Absolutely. And we have had districts who have um, land school air district wide, and they've actually had like separate accounts for elementary, middle and high school. And that way they can target their active hours specifically for each of those time frames. And so it's very specific to, hey, elementary is only from 830 to 5, et cetera. So there's some flexibility with that as well. So Emily, we, just a question from the audience. Um, you, you've been showing us the features of Land School Air. Um, so the audience member wants to know if there's a, if Land School Classic and Land School Air are separate or different licenses when you're purchasing. Great question. So you actually get both, which is great. So you've got the flexibility as far as which one you'd like to use and deploy. So we have some districts who, um, Land School Air can be used on, you know, Macs, Windows, and Chromebooks. But let's say they're one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, they may use Land School Air for that, which is a great environment. And then if they have a lab, like Kobe was mentioning, they may just use Land School Classic for that lab. So you get the flexibility of both, and you get both licenses when you purchase. Great. That's fantastic. Hey, so why why you have this up, and Ken, you're, you're in the admin settings. I want to get into a little bit about how easy it is to provision Land School. How, how what is the what is the way that you deploy and manage that? And maybe Chris, maybe have Emily show us briefly, but then I'd love to kind of hear your take on how you guys did it and any challenges or. Um, we're we're a, I want to say first we're a Chromebook district, we're a Google district, so Land School there was really a perfect fit. Um, as you see that Emily has on the screen now with the classroom management, or she had on the screen, there are two options: one is Clever and one is Google oh. Classroom. And when I um. When I first got into land school, I remember having a discussion with Kobe about wouldn't it be awesome if we could find a way to take land school and instead of having to worry about rosters and, and Excel spreadsheets, just sync with Google Classroom and was happy to be a part of, of kind of the development of that process. And it just made it super simple. Um, if you've worked with Chromebooks before, de deploying land school, I think it took me a half hour to get it done. And that's because I ran into one issue where I had to call support. Um, it, it's as simple as pushing out an app um, and then making sure that you know you have your OUs configured. So there's a there's a four or five step process. Okay. I think there's a two or three page document on it that walks you right through it, um, and as simple as it could be. Yep, and I've heard that from a lot of um, district IT staff that it can take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to fully deploy in those Chromebooks. Hey, um, let me ask you this: Do you do you deploy it to the whole school? Let's say there's a school that is um you know let's say it's a k-12 school um do you, can you choose specific student devices to deploy it to or do you deploy it to everybody we actually uh, just went through that we are not deployed in the high school right now but we are deployed k through eight and that was a switch for us this year um based on you know talking to the staff and the faculty so it was as simple for us as just setting up the right ous and pushing out the extensions to the proper ous so it, it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, it can be deployed at, at any level, however specific you want to get or however general you want to get with it. I think Emily would say, make sure that Rich Henderson has land school deployed. <laughs> Guy asked me questions. <laughs> I definitely would and mute yeah, that exactly. chat for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, um, all right. So then let's just kind of make sure that it's clear. So it works for Chromebooks, works for Windows, works for, uh, for Apple. Uh, for your kind of um, ease of deployment. If you're using a Google tool, then you're deploy with Google Classroom. If you're using like AD credentials uh, or your Windows environment, how do you deploy it? So that's that's where that Clever rostering comes into play there, Rich. So Clever is a great tool that we uh, partnered with, a great, great company we partnered with. And they basically have integrations with all those student information systems that are out there. So whether it's Canvas or, you know, PowerSchool, whatever those information systems are, we we just simply reach out to Clever. It's free to schools to use, and we get all of the rostering information. So the teachers, the students, and the classes, and uh, it's just about as seamless as Google Classroom is for Chromebooks. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, question from the audience, uh, and this may be for Kobe or Emily. Um, the question is, is Land School a separate add-on purchase? From 
purchasing a Lenovo device or is there some clarification uh, on that? There's not. I believe that's probably the, the question is, is it included with your device purchase or is it an add-on purchase? Sure. Let's, so, take it, let's take it as, as part of the Lenovo. Take it away, Emily. Sure. So what's great about if you are a Lenovo district or you purchase Lenovo devices for your district, you actually receive an entitlement of a free Land School and Land School Air license with that device. And so um, it's not preloaded. So for example, let's say you purchased 100 Lenovo devices in May, you are entitled to a Land School license and you're welcome to get those activated and you have them for, they're good for one year from the date of activation. So definitely okay, take so advantage of that. All right, so and when in the other, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. In, in the other scenario, Chris, if, or, or uh, Rich, if, if, you, if you just choose to buy it, you know, let's say you have the other devices, uh, no problem. Uh, we, you, can, you purchase one, we call it single, single uh, product pricing, and, and we give you both. So you don't have to make a decision, ah, do I want classic, do I want to use air? You get both, you can deploy them in a hybrid model, however you want to do it. We were very flexible and that's one of the big differentiators we wanted to bring to the table. Okay, so um, this brings me to a couple other questions. What if I'm a mixed district, which is which is true of a lot of our districts. I have, maybe I have a different OEMs product um, in some of my schools, um, but I'm transitioning to Lo Lenovo and I'm gonna, you know, I bought Lenovo's uh, and I know I'm gonna get my first year of land school, but what do I do about my other devices? Yeah. Emily will take care of you. Okay, yeah, great question. So those entitlements that you would get with those new Lenovo devices can be deployed to any um, device in your environment. So even though those came with those new Lenovo devices, they can be deployed to whatever devices you have in your environment. And then, of course, we're happy to get you set up to go district wide or to outfit the rest of your devices um, so that all of your teachers can have this. But we've seen that a lot where we've had districts who have entitled licenses, they try it out, they love it, and then they outfit the rest of their district or at least, you know, K through eight or whatever their need is. Well, I, I frankly, guys, I think it's awesome that, that you guys give a, a year uh, of this away for free uh, with the device purchase. I know it's always a challenge uh, in K-12 to balance the budget. Um, and, you know, I wish that we could do the whole thing for free, which we're not there yet. So um, just, just you know, the plan would be to, if I'm hearing this right, use it, um, but have a plan for renewing it as well. So you need to make sure and decide if this is something you're going to use. I mean, the, the worst case scenario might be that you get your teachers trained and excited on it, but then you don't have a budget for, for, for mm -hmm. the following years. So I think that um, that should be part of the planning Chris, um, any any thoughts from how your district views this? Uh, how long have you guys been buying the subscription or, um, and any views on kind of the ROI? So our, I, I'll, I'll be totally honest, our first year was the free year. We bought a bunch of Lenovo devices and somebody from Lenovo reached out to me at the proper time, perfect time when the teachers were begging because we had just started with Chromebooks to say they wanted a way to control. So I said, why not, we'll give it a shot. Um, that was about five and a half years ago when we started that. So our first year was free. And after that, it was overwhelming. Um, and based on the administrators, the feedback the teachers gave to the administrators and I gave, it was really a no brainer for us to continue on um, with that. Um, as land school progressed to land school air and we moved over to that platform and it became even that much easier. Our, I call it our enrollment. It's not the student enrollment, it's the teacher enrollment because that's really what matters. At this point, you can buy a thousand licenses, but if you only have two teachers using them, then it's useless. But in the last probably two or three years, our, our enrollment by teachers has quadrupled as they start to see what this can help them with. So, you know, I would plan on, you know, trying to, to figure out what grade levels it fits first and, and kind of let it roll out from there as people talk about it and hear other people getting excited, more people join on that train. Yeah, hey, that that's really good advice, Chris. Thank you, and uh, it's good to hear, you know, the the thoughtful process that you guys have taken here. Um, question from the audience, and this one may go to Kobe. How are you handling Apple's changing user centric privacy restrictions on screen recording? Yeah, with Apple, it's uh, I would say definitely over the last couple of years, it's become more challenging uh, to manage that device, right? Uh, 
we we do work we're part of the apple developer forum um so we 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 have specific uh, developers that just focus on the mac and the ios platform but as as they've started to tighten even more what we can do we obviously comply with those uh, restrictions. So in the case of sharing the screen or the thumbnail as we refer to it here, um, you know, we have to ask for permission uh, to, to get that uh, approval. Uh, once we're granted that permission on the device, then we obviously can manage and monitor and, and things of that nature. But uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, Apple has made it more challenging uh, to, to do the management, whereas on Windows or Chromebook platforms, uh, those devices have been made to be uh, very, very easily managed uh, in, in comparison. Thank you. Okay, uh, last question. Um, oh, actually, I think we may have two more questions, but let me just ask the first one. What about the camera? Can can teachers see the student through the camera? Can uh, is that is that a concern? We we do not uh, we do not allow webcams. Um, it's not that they're not on the devices, but we have specifically. Um, decided not to enable any form of a webcam. So, I mean, you can use the Google Meet. We can certainly launch students over to Google Meet or, or Teams for Education. Um, those platforms certainly allow the webcam. In, uh, in Land School, at this point, uh, we do not offer uh, the webcam view. Now, on the teacher side, uh, we are looking at uh, something in beta that we're very excited here in the future that uh, uh, you know something around that exact area where you'd be able to maybe broadcast you know more of what the what the teachers audio things of that nature but uh, at this point we're we're sticking away from the webcams right now yeah thanks kobe all right um final question uh, and this is coming from the audience from catherine can you remotely control a student's computer more than just pushing urls for example to guide a student through accessing different programs so remotely take over um, at this, it is definitely on the horizon of, of being able to do that. Uh, not, not at this time. No, not yet. Uh, Land School Classic, absolutely. We are there. It, it is a capability of the Land School Classic product. It has been for many years. Um, we have not yet in put that capability yet into air, but I wouldn't say it's too far out on the horizon. So something that's been asked for. Uh, you know, uh, the, we're, we're in beta on, on showing the teacher screen. Uh, that can be enabled. I think it is enabled for customers that request. Um, and so remote control is right there. So today, you can certainly bring up that student screen in, in big screen, and uh, but, but there's not the way to physically take over the mouse and guide the mouse uh, as if it were your own. So definitely a great enhancement. We do hear it. Thanks, Kobe. All right, well, that takes us into the wrap-up portion where I'm gonna announce the raffle winner. So everyone, uh, presenters, if you could join with me in a virtual drum roll. The winner is Catherine Rick. Catherine Rick, congratulations. You're the winner of the raffle for today. And you'll get an email from the organizers with uh, your $50 Amazon gift card. So congratulations and Delia, take us home. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for attending today. Um, and I wanna also thank all of our speakers, our guest speakers, Kobe and Chris and Emily and Rachel, especially joining us after a full day of teaching. Um, thank you so much. And I hope that we see everybody next Tuesday when we will be focused on student engagement um, and our software partner, Exploros. Um, they have an amazing curriculum platform, so I think you'll wanna hear about that. Um, you will get a follow-up email from us that has a recording of this session. Um, as well as an effective practices playbook um, about digital classroom management. And if you're interested in learning more about Land School, you can contact Lucy Marshall. We'll put her contact info in that follow-up email as well. Um, and I do just want to call out DNS Filter and Bark, who are our Land School partners um, in student safety. And we had a previous webinar that focused on them. It was our first in the series, and the recording is currently available on the website. So. Take a look there if you would like to hear that recording and see that playbook as well. Hope everybody has a great afternoon and that we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. All right, take care. Bye, Chris. Thanks, Bye. Rachel. See ya.